Welcome, everyone. Um, as you're coming in, uh, please feel free to put your name and your organization and your location in the chat, just so we can all see who's here. We'll get started in just a minute. Great to see everyone filtering in. Uh, thanks for putting your name and organization and location in the chat. Good to see people from all over the region jumping on. So thanks for joining. Uh, so um, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining the latest uh, webinar in our Building the New Forest Future series. Um, I'm Amy Scott a program manager with the Northern Forest Center, and I am based in Bethel, Maine. Um, today, we are talking about getting ahead of the flood risk and how communities can proactively mitigate for floods. Um, this is a, an excellent topic that we are excited to get into today with you. So thanks for, um, for jumping on. We have had um, <clears throat> devastating floods across our region uh, over the past several years, which have long-term impacts on, uh, on infrastructure, as we know, and the economy and many other aspects of our community health. Uh, so we're gonna really learn today about what some communities and leaders are, are doing to, to deal with that issue, as well as to get ahead of the risk. Uh, so, as I said, I am Amy Scott, and we are joined today with a uh, team behind the scenes. We have Isabella Ronson, who is a program coordinator in our Concord office, and we have Leslie Carrison, who's the Adirondack program director, joining us from New York. So they are helping out behind the scenes today. So before we jump into our panel and really get started today, I just want to mention a couple of things, a little housekeeping. Um, we are going to hear from uh, each of our panelists and then have a panel discussion. Um, at any time during the event today, you can post questions to the panelists by using the Q&A feature. So there's the chat feature, which we're all using now. Uh, but for your questions, we would appreciate you putting those into the Q&A instead of into the chat. And so we will hear from each of our panelists uh, with an introduction. And then we're going to have a bit of a discussion. And then after that, we will jump into all of your questions. So uh, thanks for that. And uh, if you're just joining, go ahead and put your name and organization and location in the chat um, as we go. Um, I also want to mention that uh, this is being recorded today and that we will provide a follow-up um, after today's session uh, with any of the resources and uh, web pages or other things that get shared today. So don't worry about trying to capture it all. Um, there will be the recording and then there will be the follow-up with all of those resources available to you. Uh, so I'm just going to let you know who's on our panel. And then we're going to take um, hear from them one at a time. Uh, so going from west to east, thanks, Isabella, for putting the uh, map up for us. We're going to start with uh, Kelly Tucker, who is the executive director of the Osable River Association based in uh, Wilmington, New York. And then we are going to hear from Ned Swanberg, who is a regional floodplain manager at the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources and is the manager of Flood Ready Vermont. And lastly, we'll hear from Phil Cloutier, who's the Director of Emergency Management and also the Fire Chief in Gorham, New Hampshire. And um, apologies to Maine, we don't have a panelist from Maine today, but I think we have plenty to hear about uh, from our other states. 
So let's um, kick, turn it over to Kelly, who is going to be the first uh, panelist we hear from. Uh, take it away, Kelly. Thank you, Amy. I'm Kelly Tucker, Executive Director of the Sable River Association. I've been in the nonprofit conservation field for 30 years, working to implement solutions to protect freshwater and wildlife, sustain ecological diversity, and provide local communities with tools for economic and climate resilience. I'm in my 10th year as executive director. Um, got the slide up, okay. The Sable River Association is based in the 6 million acre Adirondack Park, a special place, as many of you know, that receives strong ecosystem protections from New York State, but nevertheless has its challenges. In many ways, it is an excellent laboratory for building models to tackle issues like the one we are discussing today. The association celebrates its 25th anniversary this year. Uh, two to three years ago, we began to slowly expand the geographic scope of our work beyond the Sable watershed. A year ago, we became an Adirondack-wide organization. We're small, 10 staff and a $2 million budget, and practically speaking, our focus in the coming few years remains in the Sable and the surrounding watersheds, especially the Lake Champlain Basin. Our mission is to advance science and stewardship of Adirondack freshwater. With respect to building flood and climate resilience, our work focuses on field science that informs assessment of freshwater ecosystem health and resilience. That's geomorphic, physical, chemical, and biological. And then we share that information to create community investment in solutions that protect and restore self-sustaining self streams, lakes, and wet wetland health. Next slide. The problems we face in the Adirondacks are similar to problems you see throughout the new Northeast. There's just a few of them here, up, upper left, erosion, upper right, aggradation. Indeed, probably some of the material from the eroding bank on the left is there in the what should be the main channel on the on the top side of the picture to the right top. Um, this, for those who are in the area, is the just below the confluence of the east and west branch of Sable River in Sable Forks. Um, the undersized road crossings exacerbated by lack of floodplain access, a blown out uh, state road from uh, Irene, and roads are communities most established over 100 years ago um, that hug the river. And in most every image here, there's a road uh, right next to the river, uh, which explains many of the problems. The project work we do, um, now always within the context of broader planning, is the most visible side of our work. Next slide. Um, so we remove small barriers like these culverts. We've created something called a climate ready culvert. Um, that's been got, it's getting a lot of attention um, throughout the Northeast and the United States. We also moved large barriers. Next slide. That's at the top. You can see the dam sort of at the center of the image there. That's on the west branch of Sable River, uh, a dam that was over 100 years old, um, removed to create a free flowing lower west branch of Sable River. Very exciting. Next slide. We also restore floodplain access and the form and function of the river channel. Um, this is a project we did in 2020. Um, we basically are narrowing a river that is way over wide, that's been damaged in many ways. You can see that sort of sluggish uh, river channel. Um, and we reform this new river. And basically what we're doing is we're giving the river back its tools so that it can recreate itself. Next, uh, next slide. We also, um, we also restore floodplain access, creating new floodplains. But this is the sexy stuff. Um, this is the tools or products of impl implementation. The essential work takes place before all this. That's the field-based science and assessment that goes past symptoms to identify and address causes. The historical and geological context, the intimacy of place that we have because we live in the place that we work, the shared perspective of partners, agencies, and funders, and in essentially the community understanding why this often slow and costly route that we take leads to greater long-term benefits. 
So I'm grateful to be here today to share some of our experience building self-sustaining flood resilience for our communities in the Adirondacks from the perspective of our streams. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, that's a great overview, much appreciated. Um, we are going to move now to Ned in Vermont. So take it away, Ned. Hi, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be here today. Um, it's great to be with everybody across the Northern Forest region, a lot of similar uh, issues that we're all dealing with. So in Vermont, I work with the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation as a regional floodplain manager. I'm also a resident of Montpelier, Vermont, which got hammered in July. So still trying to figure out what to do in that context as a member of the Montpelier Commission on Recovery and Resilience. So we're kind of trying to pull together some of those stories. So for, for Vermont, um, and Isabel, I'll just say next as we go along. There we go, thanks. Um, how do we how do we avoid damage? And you know, flooding is a natural feature in the North Temperate Zone. It's supposed to be here. It's natural. It's expected. It's common. It's valuable. It doesn't need to be a disaster. Next, in Vermont, over twelve thousand structures are already built into the high risk special flood hazard area. And so this is also a legacy issue of how do we learn from new information and how do we adapt to that and try to avoid problems going forward. Next. Um, it, it's not only an issue for the owners of those structures and the people that are living and working in those structures, but it's also an issue for all of us that live even outside of the flood hazard areas and erosion hazard areas because we are bearing the cost, particularly of the damage in these landscapes where they're mountainous or hilly, there's power gradient ripping up roads and taking out culverts. So we have a huge amount of expense that's mostly borne by ourselves as federal, as state, and as municipal taxpayers. Next. Um, looking across the region back in July, we were having a very wet season and it was hard to spend a lot of time out of doors out of doors in dry weather. Uh, in this case, you can see all the rain hitting the mountains in July leading up to the big flood date of the 10th in Vermont. Uh, Vermont actually being spared, next. And then the rain shifted and the plume of moisture coming off of Florida drifted up the spine of the greens and uh, over nine inches in many places, kind of commensurate with the, the flood of record in Vermont, which was 1927, next. Um, it led to a huge number of communities, um, Hardwick and Johnson and Ludlow and Barry and Montpelier and others um, dealing with a tremendous amount of water. Um, these are shots, photos from around town, uh, combined sewer outfalls with sewage backups. We had uh, historic structures being flooded in the basements and first floor levels built long before there was information about how high floods will come. Um, or should have been available anyway. On the bottom right, you can see the railroad bridge, which hangs low in the valley like most railroad bridges and became a trash rack for all sorts of debris and uh, uh, insulation and styrofoam and propane tanks. And in the center, the graph is just an indication of, we have some of the clues about how to reduce flood risk already available to us in situations where we have a detailed study in our flood insurance study on our FEMA or national flood insurance rate maps in our communities. And so in the center, you can see the uh, vertical bar and that indicates the, the top and bottom of the next railroad trestle down the valley from the one in the photograph. And the line with the double dash, long dash, not quite the top one, is the height of the base flood uh, water as it comes to the bridge, piles up behind it, and then drops below the bridge. It's basically elevating the flood level in the community about three feet. So if we could do something about these railroad bridges, it would do a whole lot for us. Next, thank you. So in this image, you can see the cross sections coming across the Winooski and the North Branch from the upper right. And uh, this is information we use to try to plan for safer structures going forward. Um, and this is really important, but most of these structures were built before the map. And so we have a legacy of exposure. 
and the flooding that happened in July was larger than the insurance sized flood. And, uh, and so in this image, you can see around the edges, the kind of brownish area, which is the area of the quote 500 year flood or the next larger modeled flood. And, uh, and that came closer to what we experienced at that time. In the right hand side, USGS engineer is pointing to the top of the railing on Langdon Street, how high the water came in July. Thank you. Next. So we have a situation right now, next, where after flooding, we have damage. People get upset. You know, there's a loss of property, uh, erosion, flooding. People want to do localized fixes by filling and berming and dredging and armoring. Next. And then that ends up creating a situation which prevents the floodplains from working because the floodplains are part of the, the system, the natural system that is important for us by slowing the water down. And so when we do these spot fixes and we straighten, we armor and we fill and we dredge, we're actually accelerating the water down the hill uh, to affect the next property, the next road, the culvert and the community down the valley. So we're trying to get out of this vicious cycle and uh, find our way to a, a more sustainable relationship with streams and rivers. Next. So in Vermont, we're really trying to look at both the flood hazard area where we have these maps and in particular using the ones that we have through the uh, National Flood Insurance Program because they are helpful, if not perfect. Um, and we're also talking about the river corridor, the area near the river, the room needed by the river to adjust over time from side to side without becoming dug down and losing its ability to actually flood. Because when the water floods, goes over bank, it slows down, drops sediment, and doesn't come crashing into town quite as fast. So we're taking the, the peak and reducing the peak. So the key idea is no adverse impact to the functioning of the floodplain and the room needed by the river, and hence the, the kinds of community functions that we pay for and our neighbors and their well being. Next. So we have model bylaws that we're using in Vermont, encouraging in Vermont, and they have those two basic components for no adverse impact, protecting the area inside the river corridor where we can expect it to adjust over time to handle its energy and not dig down and not become faster and more erosively destructive, leave room for the rivers. And also in the flood hazard area to be not adding new fill and so therefore also making sure we have space to accommodate the water and slow it down before it shows up in town. And the more of this we can practice across the watershed, the more all of us benefit as federal, state, local taxpayers and people living in and near floodplains. So we're trying to have the floodplains actually work for us uh, and not increase the risk for others. Next, so protect what works, room for the rivers and floodplains, and then next, improve the floodplain functions where they're already lost, where there's already been fill pads and historic development that's problematic, railroad trestles that are set so low as to aggravate the problem in the community and other bridge problems you can pick off. Um, and then begin to reduce the risk also for uh, the, the buildings with families and workplaces and critical services to be sure that these are available to us when we need them. And then to be planning for what we're going to do in the event of a flood and how we're going to be actually moving to a more resilient stance as we go forward. Next. So bylaws kind of promoting these basic ideas. Um, next. This is a gauge on the MAD. And uh, you can see at the very top, the blue arrow to the height of the 1927 flood in Vermont, flood of record. Below that, August 2011, which was Tropical Storm Irene, and below that, the Q100, which is the insurance program-sized flood on the Mad River, which after they finish re-delineating and republishing those maps in the coming three years or so, um, that'll still be the map, the size of the flood that we will be regulating to and preparing for when in fact we've had larger floods within 100 years. And so we have to be mindful that the, the flood insurance rate maps are helpful, um, but they're, they're not really adequate to describe even the current risk that we have on most of these systems. Next. Um, looking across the United States has been a huge shift um, because of the change in global climate. And so the blue areas here are showing places where we're seeing an acceleration, intensification of 
the water cycle in the Northeast is one of those places where we have mountains sticking up and catching uh, new levels of moisture we've never quite seen in recent history. Next. On the left, you can see since the 1970, a real break in the average amount of precipitation falling in Vermont. We're into a whole new cycle of, of wet in this area. And that's a key thing that we have to be prepared for. And on the right, fresh map just came out showing global, uh, actually tropical sea surface temperatures um, as of March 2024, right here last week, being higher than they were in August of last year. So last year we had water off of Florida, over 100 degrees, again, plumes of moist air coming up to the Northeast and hitting the cool mossy mountains of the Appalachians, the Whites and the Adirondacks. You know, this next year, we're likely to see that again, hitting West Virginia, hitting Virginia, hitting Maine, New Hampshire, New York, and Vermont. So we have to be really understanding that we're moving into a whole new system at this point. Next. In this study that was done by the Gund Institute in Gurevich, they looked at uh, the importance of doing floodplain restoration, the left-hand bars, and they were showing value to doing good floodplain restoration. Um, and it would really be helping people with, uh, you know, in, in terms of property values and down below in terms of the kinds of people that are using single family homes and mobile homes, some of the most vulnerable kinds of living structures that we have on our landscapes. Uh, but on the right, in the center set of bars, you can see uh, both that, you know, with an uh, understanding of the increase in, in precipitation coming through climate change actively underway now, we're going to see far more damage happening across these quintiles, across these housing types. And on the far right, you can see that with our doing the best we can with floodplain restoration, it's still not going to be the gains that we're looking for right now. So we've got to get ahead of this by understanding what we're about to get hit by or what we're being hit by now. And uh, so we need a lot of things that can be done by ourselves and our communities. And in part, we need to be thinking globally as well. Thank you, next. So how can we avoid losses due to flooding? Next. We can do family plan. We can have an emergency plan, know to, where to meet each other, get our finances in order, get flood insurance perhaps, move our house in the nick of time. As a community, we can do stuff to help adopt regulations to not put people into harm's way. And uh, next, as uh, state and federal actors, we can be developing data and incentives for communities to get ahead of this and not be building into places that are attractive nuisances and dangerous to us all. Next. So again, Floodplains uh, and river corridors provide natural and beneficial functions for all of us. They're places that store and move flood water, ice, and debris. They keep the water clean by allowing the water and the, and the filth, the, the silt and the mud to settle out, creating nutrients and trapping those on the landscape and keeping it out of the river and the lakes. Um, and they enrich the soil. They recharge the, the water supply, the aquifers in those areas. There's important places for agriculture and forestry, wildlife, natural communities, recreation. And importantly, these floodplains are providing value to us by reducing flood levels and erosive flood power. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Ned. Uh, really, yeah, really appreciate that, um, <clears throat> that overview. Um, and the a bit of the broader view as well. So we're going to turn to New Hampshire and hear from uh, Phil Cloutier. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Phil Cloutier. I'm the fire chief here in Gorham. I'm also the emergency management director, the health officer, the code enforcement officer, among many other things, it feels like. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of my perspective on the situation obviously comes from the emergency response, but, you know, we're also working on the mitigation as well. Uh, next. So Gorham itself, we sit in the Androscoggin River Valley. Uh, we have three major rivers running through town, including the Androscoggin and a large brook that also runs into it, all of which, you know, a lot of um, ice flow and snow melt off the, the mountains that really lead to a bunch of flooding issues. So it's a beautiful place to live, but when it, it um, when it's not, then we have trouble. Next. So some of the things that the tools that we use to get ahead of it, 
you know, at all towns and cities in New Hampshire typically have hazard mitigation plans, which outline a lot of your issues that you can expect to see in town and problem areas that can be fixed. So that's, you know, that's one thing that we keep at the forefront. Emergency operations plan, which helps us to determine how we'll act after the problem occurs. So we use, rely on that pretty heavily. And also getting ahead of equipment and personnel. That's, you know, making sure we have everything in place that we need to uh, react to these issues as they occur. Next. So, you know, what this brought this to the forefront for me, I've been chief for four and a half years, and this was my first actual main flooding event. So in the picture on the left, you can see a bridge that went to our local sand pit that was washed out on, on our Moose Brook. On the same brook in the top right is uh, the water truck from Pike Paving stuck under the bridge. Believe it or not, that water was coming up over the bridge with trees on it at one point. And then the bottom is a picture of one of our trucks going through water after um, evacuating some homes. So, you know, with all these hundred year storms that we're seeing every three or four years, we can expect more and more of these type of issues to arise. We're just working on several plans to get ahead of them in town, but that's, that's where we stand for now. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, appreciate that. So we are going to uh, ask all our panelists to come on screen now. Um, <clears throat> and we are going to um, just take some time to have a discussion and sort of build on what we've just heard from each of you. And again, I just want to remind uh, people who are listening in that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. We, we will get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, and uh, we want this to be as, as interactive as, as possible. So I just want to start with, um, there's, there's, there's so much to talk about here. <laughs> um, and you know we're talking uh, many levels too, including very much at the community level. Um, you know, your example in New Hampshire is right on the ground in, in one town, you know, all the way up through a watershed. And then uh, Ned is, is looking at this from a statewide perspective. Um, so, you know, one, one of the things I think uh, all of you touched on some of this, but it, it'd be good to just hear a little bit more about, you know, how, how have we, gotten to this point, you know, not, not just the climate side of things, but what are the things that um, we have done in terms of, you know, some of you have mentioned roads and bridges and placements, um, but what are the ways that um, we've really land, what have contributed to us landing in this position that we're in now? So in Gorham, you know, we we're built around a river valley, you know, everybody wants to live right on the river. It's a beautiful place to live. And, you know, that's nice until it's not. And, and unfortunately, at certain places in our town, you know, the river has changed ways over the years and we've manipulated it perhaps to get it where we want it to go to build houses. And the river is going to find its way back to where it wants to go. And, and I also think one of the main reasons we run into issues is because, you know, not that many years ago, it was a lot more lenient on maintenance that occurred in the river. You know, you might just throw a bulldozer in the river and do some dredging and that type of stuff can't happen anymore. And it shouldn't, I guess, you know, based on some of some stuff that Ned was talking about, you know, that it, the idea is not just to make a deeper place to go. It's to build the floodplains back and all that, you know. So there's a lot of planning that goes into getting back to a balance between nature and the people. And and it's interesting. I mean, so many of the things that Phil says are true. And and once again, yeah, Ned in that in that broad view pointed to some of these. In the Adirondacks, it's it's kind of ironic, right? People come to the Adirondacks, it's a park, um, and it's, you know, it's pretty. Um, and, you know, unless you're a trained geomorphologist or a hydrologist, you you often look at the river and go, well, that looks okay. Um, but we don't. Um, and, and there's a legacy of use in the Adirondacks. I mean, this was a place that was saved because trees were being cut and erosion was causing so much devastation that water was in trouble. So that's why the park is in the, in the constitution. Um, 
it's about water. And the lumbering industry here in the Hudson, in the Asable, in the Boquette, it was it was massive. Um, the J and J Rogers Paper Company, um, they were a pulp mill first. Um, they did saw wood for a while, but from the late teen, eight, late eighteen hundreds, when iron ore was first discovered, and they were cutting trees to run furnaces to smelt iron ore through the logging period into the paper period, which lasted into the 1960s, the river was a transportation artery. It was working and it was about moving logs down the river. So they blasted riffles, which of course, they hold the grade control. They widened the river. They created channels on the side. There was a great deal of, of manipulation. At the same time, communities are building growing up right beside the river, because back in the day, that was what was convenient. You know, your back ends to the river, your sewage goes in the river. Um, so it was really just a tool for many years. Um, it's, it's growing value, you know, in the 1900s still didn't prevent the very thing, you know, Phil points to. Yeah, you drop an excavator in to make it wider and deeper for the next storm. Interestingly, Though the word drought isn't appropriate, we have gone through a dry period in the Northeast from the late 20s until the late 1990s. And if you look at you know, your water year and you look at your gauge readings, you'll probably see more moderate to minor storms in that period. And since the late 1990s, especially in the Adirondacks, we've seen more moderate to major flood events. So is that a return to where it, where it used to be plus climate change? Potentially, but there's so much context that's essential to how we treat the river today. Yeah. Ned, do you want to add in to any of that? Yeah, there's so many, Amy, that's a great question. There's so many pieces of it. It would be a very rich topic all by itself. But yeah, part of it is, uh, you know, we've had, we've lived as people, you know, in the Northeast for what, 12,000 years or 14,000 years. And uh, hopefully we'll be there for another 14,000 years if we can figure out how to live with rivers, you know? And you would think that we're capable of learning and adapting, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a process. And, uh, you know, as people move through the landscape, we're often following the, you know, the easiest way through the mountains, you know, right next to the stream and the river. And that becomes a road. It becomes a place you have to put your house and live your life. And so, We've developed all these permanent features in a landscape which is is uh, kind of foolish because we simply don't really know what those rivers and streams are doing. In a lot of places, we've we've taken a narrow valley with a, a stream and we've pinched it with a road, and we're telling the stream, you know, now you can have you know a quarter of a valley, you know, and that creates problems, chronic chronic problems. We also have had gone through a period uh, across the country with a love of railroads. And so again, you know, as railroads became the first big interstate transportation systems, they, you know, they're all set at a certain grade and they, uh, they became huge linear blockages, oftentimes cutting off meander bends and floodplains and, and really constraining our valleys. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different things that have happened that transformed our landscape and have really kind of increased the risk that we have now. Um, and again, building in places in permanent ways that are, are, are vulnerable to um, ourselves. The other thing I might even throw out there too is there's always this controversy about beavers, but no beavers in the Northern country and beavers create uh, wetlands and, and slow the water down. But the landscape that we colonized, you know, as permanent culture came into the Northeast, we found basically no beavers, right? They were all gone. And what we had is big flat open meadows. And, uh, and basically that's where we put the livestock and built the, the barn right next to it. So we've created a landscape that insists on rivers and streams and fast delivery of water down the hill rather than big, huge valleys of beaver flowage. You know, so all of us know a little bit about the two of those, but in our landscape, it's really shifted quite a bit. That's sad. So before we uh, talk about um, ways to deal with this now, because we've, we're talking about a lot of infrastructure that's almost kind of in the way, it seems, uh, or literally uh, very much in the way, 
Um, can you each speak a little bit to the kinds of assessments that you're using to understand, you know, where did this river originally go? You know, what, what did the landscape look like? How did it function? Um, who are you engaging to do those kinds of assessments? What do those look like? Uh, is the, are the communities involved? Um, tell us a little bit more about that. So in Gorham, you know, we have, <clears throat> there's been some older pictures that came out that showed places where the river used to be. And we also have, you know, historical features that we can see berms that were in different places on the other side of the road than the river, such as that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of history. We know a lot of Gorham was a riverbed at one time based on the ground and all that. Uh, but, you know, our local historical society has pictures of the floods, you know, and they've come out on Facebook and all that. And I think reaching out to people and asking them what they have for historical flooding pictures really helps. I know here at the station, when looking back at some of the older projects, we have have a bunch of pictures of the last time the river, there was a bulldozer in the river. And that really gives us an idea of how it was how it was meant to go then as compared to what it is now. So I think fortunately there's comes from a time when people printed pictures out and hopefully they're out there somewhere. You ever uh, um, put a call out to Facebook or anything like that? <laughs> it's, <interesting. laughs> um, you know, that's a, that's a, it's a good idea to crowdsource that we haven't, we haven't really yet, but you know, we, we, Steal them off of Facebook when they come up, but it would be a good idea to reach out and kind of crowdsource as much as we could. So for us, we, um, I mean, this is one of the things we do. So um, the Sable River Association has been around for 25 years, but since for the past 10 years, we've, we've professionalized so that we can specifically solve these problems with an eye toward uh, physical, chemical, ecological uplift, and biological uplift. So we're particularly interested in our native brook trout because this is, by most climate warming scenarios, one of the last great places for brook trout, um, especially the east branch of Sable River, ironically, because most people see the west branch as the, the nicer river. Um, so we have a team of, a small team of scientists um, with, um, um, geomorphic expertise, geologic expertise, physical chemical water quality expertise, and, and biological expertise. Um, so uh, most of us are, I am trained and another staffer is trained in, in the methodologies for assessing river corridors. Um, we do full longitudinal profiles, cross sections. We do the geomorphic work in order to build the argument for a comprehensive uh, look at a river section. Uh, we do work very closely, and we wouldn't be here without the United States Fish and Wildlife Service's Cortland office. Their partners for Fish and Wildlife Program are experts in these fields. Um, we work with a variety of other experts in the fields. We we don't have an engineer on staff, so we work with engineers as needed to, to come in and stamp designs when we need those. Um, I think we're all dealing with no-rise uh, specifications when we do in channel restoration work or we restore floodplains. Um, so we do, depending on the project, if it's if it's a culvert, we do 90% of the work. We also oversee construction. We've trained a work crew, we've trained a couple work crews. So there's a whole uh, a whole investment in our part on actually bringing the work into our communities, making it affordable communities for our communities, working with our landowners and then following up and monitoring success over time. Because as I noted at the beginning, we like to think of this place as having great potential for being a model. Um, so the things that we work here, that work for us here are gonna face different challenges in other places, but if at least we've got the ground covered, we've got the basic tenants covered, we've proven they work. So that's always a, a great first step. Thanks, Kelly. Ned, do you want to jump in? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, no, it's it's uh, a lot of historical societies will have images of the river in the past, like Philip indicated, and it's really helpful. Um, in Vermont, the uh, University of Vermont uh, Landscape Change Program has an online portal where people upload old photos and try to identify where they are and then ask you to go out and take a new photo and look at how things have changed. So some of that is flood related and you can look at it or by keyword or location. 
Um, so those are all helpful by way of crowdsourcing that data. We've also uh, looked at uh, old aerial photos going back even to the 40s um, and uh, using those with contemporary aerial photography to trace out the position of the channel and how the channels shift over time, basically moving in a sinuous pattern as they move their way through the landscape. So you can, you can actually document how this pattern gets established and propagated over time. And again, the idea with river corridors is to say, well, we can see that behavior happening. And so if we can understand the meander area that's needed for that river with that radiant and those sediments and that power, we can stay out of the way. And so that's the essence of the river corridor map is to help identify that area and get out of the way so that we don't have to uh, lose roads and houses and critical services that get placed in a spot that doesn't get wet, but falls into the river. Um, so that's also, again, maintaining an equilibrium flow and access to the floodplains. It all kind of works together. And that documentation is really important. And uh, yeah, thank you. So one thing I was just going to add after, you know, Ned talked about old historical aerial photography. One of the things we did recently is we worked with one of our local search and rescue groups who has some drones and they did, they flew the sections of the river that we've been having issues with. And, and you can even see, you know, based on the videos, historical ways that the rivers used to flow. They, they've they left, obviously left uh, scars on the earth of where they, they used to go and maybe where they should be going again. So that's something that's come in handy, is coming in handy with our move forward. Yeah, along those same lines, oops, I'm jumping in, Kelly. Um, no. But along those same lines, Phil, um, in Vermont, we now have uh, online at the A&R Atlas, uh, a layer called uh, Hillshade with mm. done by very high quality LIDAR. And if you turn that on, you can see those meander bends uh, appearing in the landscape, which is now you know, forested or away from the channel. And you can really get a sense of this dynamic landscape from that data too. Yeah. Sorry. Kelly, did you want to respond earlier? Or... No, I think they've covered okay. the bases okay. pretty well. Okay. It's just that good. there are a lot of good tools and, and we're actually going to be flying LIDAR again uh, because mm -hmm. we had fantastic LIDAR done in, in 2014 after Irene um, having those kinds of tools and drones, um, heat imagery, thermal imagery. There's a lot of cool stuff. If you can get someone to buy it for you or you can borrow someone or have someone, yeah, like UVM fly it for you. Um, you can really pull a lot of great information, um, which I think is a step toward being in the field. Um, we've relied a lot on models. Um, and, you know, I'm a trained academic. We love models, right? Um, they give you an idea of, of what might be true, but the key is the word might. Um, you know, even those FEMA floodplain cross sections, it's better if you go in the field and verify them because what you find there is the bump in the LIDAR that you didn't quite know what it was. And it actually inflects the, the, the model that's there and it's an old dam or, you know, so there's, there's all these pieces in the field that it just doesn't beat going out and measuring. Um, and that's, so we really especially in these rural areas where, you know, in denser towns, you've got so many eyes, you know, they can tell you so many things, but here in the 6 million acre Adirondack park, where, you know, the population is like what the population of Burlington, um, we, we don't have that kind of human eyes on, you know, that we can talk to. So we do need to rely on some of these tools and they are getting better and better, but nothing beats the field. Yeah, great. Well, so I'd like each of you to talk about some of the projects that you're actually doing. Um, but as you talk about those, um, it, you know, it strikes me that a lot of what I'm hearing all of you say is that part of the solution here is is letting the river be the river, uh, and that we've put a lot of things in the way, and we've moved it around, and we've shifted it, and we've used it in certain ways that are causing it to not. Um, be able to um, uh, do its thing as a river and and spread out and not not cause all this damage. So, so I I'd love to hear about some of the projects you're doing, uh, and I'd really like to hear about how you work with communities or landowners, um, departments of transportation, et cetera, 
on the conflict because clearly, you know, if a road is in a place that's clearly a problem, the solution is not just to build the road again. That's what you're all saying, you know, that this is really about the science of, of the way rivers flow. Um, well, moving a road is not that simple. Uh, eliminating a railroad bridge or raising it by 15 feet is not that simple. Uh, you know, moving the hundreds or thousands of people's homes to a different space is not that simple. So um, I'd just like to hear a little bit more about, you know, not just the mechanics of some of the projects that you're doing. So I think you think that people are interested in that. How do you do this stuff? Um, but then how do you also... Um, educate communities to understand why this is necessary, how this works, and then how do you actually deal with those specific conflicts of those things that are not very easy? So I think someone in the chat asked a specific question about climate ready culverts. So I'll address that. But um, before I do that, I think, you know, what we are doing here is primarily resolving what I call stream human conflicts, pattern after wildlife human conflicts. Um, we don't go into the Adirondack backcountry or nor do we advocate, you know, there's a lot of old infrastructure there and the and rivers and streams and wetlands have learned to work around it. In some cases that may be causing problems with sedimentation downstream, um, but we're not, we're leaving rivers to roam and we're, you know, we totally advocate doing doing everything you can first to move infrastructure, but you're absolutely right. It's sometimes impossible to even move three homes and even a small county road. In fact, that's precisely where there isn't $3 million to replace an old concrete structure. So we do do things like retrofit if we have to. And in some of the projects where we're doing stream restoration, we're, we know that the floodplain bench we've bought space for isn't quite big enough, right? We know that there are compromises when we're in these tight places, when we've asked all those questions. Um, so there's that. Um, in terms of climate ready culverts and the question I saw in the chat, um, as are climate ready culverts where infrastructure does not intervene are sized at 125% of what we call bankful width. That's the, the width at which the the water would just tip onto the floodplain in, in that, that, that 1.5 year spring flood, which is a, a flood that we consider very dynamic as geomorphologists. Um, so 125% of bankful and where possible manage a 100 year flow at 80% of the culvert's capacity. So that extra 20% buys you a lot. Um, we use natural materials whenever possible, local cobble from area waterways that we've stored to rebuild stream beds, for example. Our footers are set at the slope of the reach, the design reach of the stream. So if, you know, if the stream's like this, we don't build the culvert like this. We build the culvert with the stream. Um, so that's mimicking the reference reach. So our methods for determining stream width, slope, and embeddedness, they follow the aquatic organism passage program. They follow the functional, functional framework, which is a framework developed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and they follow natural channel design methods. So that's a variety of methodologies. Um, we are doing a floodplain restoration right now, and I think it's a really good example of working with the community. So we don't have a lot of floodplains in the Asable. It's a pretty steep system. Um, it comes out of the 500, 5,000 foot Adirondack Mountains in a pretty short, um, but where we do have them, uh, we have often have farming fields. Um, and we have a floodplain here in our area that's a hay field. So we're working with that farmer to take his hay field out of production for a year, right? So we've got to find another farm field that we can produce on so he can feed his cattle. So we're working with USDA to make sure that's at a certain quality. So we get the farmer to give us that hay, that field for a year, and then we have to rebuild that floodplain so that it remains functional for him as a, as a, as a farm field, right? Because that's possible. And it's usually, once again, just about that berming that, you know, both Phil and Ned have mentioned, you know, but it's also height and access. Um, so that's, you know, the town's involved, the county's involved, USDA's involved, um, our local congresswoman's involved. 
Um, a lot of this work has come out of not just Irene, but in 2022, we had an ice dam break in upstream in East Branch of Sable River. And that project I showed you the side by side from saved one community upstream, but couldn't save another community, which was downstream because there are about eight more projects on the way. So this is just another one of those projects that allows us to store that ice and store that that flood water, but also enriches the farm capacity, the field capacity of that hay field. So yes, there are conflicts, but once people in the community start seeing the long-term value of these things, we found they buy in really quickly, um, including the highway teams, the DPWs, the first folks that we built climate ready culverts with were our local towns. So interesting. Yeah. Phil, do you want to just since you're right in a town and you're all your infrastructure in your whole town is probably <laughs> if you want to yeah, jump so, on that um, next. You know, we it's very hard. We look at all the rivers, right? So all, all the houses are right along the rivers. So creating that that floodplain space like Kelly was talking about with a, a field doesn't really exist. We we do have a recreational area that we were able to <clears throat> take over or we were able to have some land that belonged to another large landowner in town is going to be uh, taken over by us. You know, it was a, something we worked out with them. So we're going to, we're going to work on making that into a floodplain area. Uh, it's about six or seven acres. You know, it may not be everything that we a hundred percent need to make it work, but we, we have to work with what we have. You know, we, we're in the process of looking at tearing down a house and, and making, taking that out of the river, you know, because that area is, is not going to be, uh, savable. It's hard when all that, when everything is right next to it, but we're kind of in damage control and doing the best, looking at the projects that will, will have the least impact on people, but help the most homes, I guess, is where we're at right now. Yeah, there's just not a lot of places that we can take over. The houses line the rivers, so. Right, and are there, are there road examples that, um, that either you're hoping to move or to restructure? Um, um, so we, we do have the one house that the, the bank washed out from underneath it is about 60 feet from Route 16, which is a major highway in and out of town. Um, there's no real place to move it. You know, we're in such valleys with these roads that we just don't have a place to put them. And, and that that is actually the place where I was talking about where the berm, where the original river was, was on the other side of the road but there's no room to move the road because it's a mountain on the other side. So it's, you know, the roads typically were built along the rivers, like Ned said, because that's the best place to put them and we don't have much room to move them. We're kind of stuck with, with roads, unfortunately. Right. Ned, do you want to build on that? Um, no, you're, you're dealing yeah. with, you know, dozens of river systems. So yeah, yeah. And so we're we're all pointing at the real issues. You know, it's it's complex and it takes patience. It takes working together for the partners and and funders and incremental gains and all that sort of stuff. It, it's it's so true. Um and in Vermont, like regarding the climate ready culvert, you know, we do have a program in the state now to uh by by permit require all permit, all culverts to come in at the overbank full size. Uh, to accommodate the geomorphic stability of the of the stream, and then working with fish and wildlife funding, also to help get some money to help with uh, an aquatic organism passage in the same process. So there's all those kinds of things happening. I again, I'm in Montpelier, and uh, so a lot of devastation, you know, in July, a big uh, concern in in December. Um, and uh, you know we're trying to figure out what can we do. You know what can we actually budge here? And it's very difficult. But you know we have really the committee is kind of broken into three major groups. One is to come up with a better flood response. You know so uh, Phil talked about having a local emergency management plan. But then a lot of times you could have an annex. It's basically what do we do in case of the flood or the fire or the drought or the heat wave? You know. But there's a whole protocol that you can develop, and most towns don't have that in Montpelier. Has discovered we need that you know what do you actually do when the water's rising and and when do the business owners start pulling stuff out of the basement right um and all sorts of other things so that we're working on that um we're also looking at um how can we have a more adaptive downtown over time and already montpelier is in the 
community rating system, which is a, you know, says we'll do more conscientious management of risk over time and we'll get for, as a reward access to less costly flood insurance. So that helps a little bit, but it's really kind of ramped up the quality of what happens in the city. Um, and that includes making sure that any new building or substantially improved building is again, two feet, at least two feet above the flood level uh, under the insurance program. Water comes in larger than that. Um, and uh, so that's that's helping. Um, also, we have the local hazard mitigation plan. Most communities have that in place now, which you know is a laundry list of all the things of mind that need to be dealt with. We need a generator here. We need a uh, you know a dry hydrant there, and we need a safe way to get to a shelter. You know, et cetera. So there's a whole list of things that could happen. Usually, somebody gets tagged to do it, and then there's a deadline, and it never quite gets done. And so that's the problem is just moving those things. And after a flood, you know, our city is suddenly saying, yes, we've got to move these things. You know, these we've got to find a way to get these things off of start. And one of the projects that popped up was at the confluence of the Stevens Branch and the Winooski and uh, you know, the Historical Society, the Preservation Trust noted that this historic farmhouse is falling apart due to flooding. And you know they're they're ready to let it go, and so it's now been possible to talk to them about acquiring it and removing it, and acquiring a lot of the adjacent land and uh, lowering the floodplain, much as Kelly was describing, so that would have more capacity for capturing and storing and slowing flood water before it comes into downtown. Um, so there's things like that that are moving, and it's going to be incremental. You know we've got pieces going together right now about the acquisition and then there's going to be some money to do the engineering and then there'll be some money to do the actual regrading all these things you know taking time and not being magic and instant um and then i keep going back and i'm looking at those bridges and i'm just saying you know here here are these bridges that are you know causing clear problems built and replaced you know before there was thinking about flood maps and and flood impacts um, but yeah, it's absolutely an issue. You know, FEMA would look at that and say, so what is the, the benefit cost analysis for, you know, replacing this or the transportation authority? And, and you have to work through all that stuff. In the case of FEMA and the hazard mitigation assistance program, they will actually look at the, you know, the, the impact of doing this action, acquiring and removing the structure or let's say the bridge. And they will also look at, you know, what are the impacts in terms of like reducing damage to other buildings. They'll also look at ecosystem services that are provided by having done that. You know, maybe it encompasses, again, floodplain function and phosphorus, per, you know, uh, deposition. Maybe it includes, I think not actually. Um, it also would include potentially riparian habitat. And so there's all these other ecosystem services that can be identified and uh, tagged and valued in the benefit cost analysis under that program. And then you might need to still go out to a whole nother program uh, for clean water or other, other endeavors to help match that and make the project viable. But um, we're just getting going. And uh, one of the things that's happening right now is people at the state of uh, Vermont Emergency Management is, are scrambling to bring in some support and engineers to look at clusters of problems around the state on the Lamoille, on the Black, on the Winooski, and think about where we can get floodplain rec reconnection and, and restoration, um, and then identify a handful of projects. And then our group, our commission would be part of the talking to the community about what's actually viable, what's actually, can, can we support, move forward, how we prioritize these things to, to make incremental gains. At some point, I suspect we're gonna run out of steam again, um, sadly enough, but that's where the, the local hazard mitigation planning process can collect that list of 20 more projects and hopefully just keep tagging somebody to keep moving them forward. Um, it's, a, it's a slow process. Ned, are those um, hazard mitigation plans required in Vermont? Is that a, a municipal requirement at this point? Yeah, almost. It's basically, it's a, it's a concoction of FEMA under their hazard mitigation assistance program. So any town that would like help, uh, would like um, uh, to access a grant to do an acquisition or to do something that has a mitigation program, they need to have a plan that's been approved. 
And so that's the key thing, the driver. And in Vermont, we actually do have a structure called ERAF, which uh, is an incentive to make sure that towns have their emergency management plans in place and they have their hazard mitigation plans in place and they're doing good things in the floodplain and the river corridor. And by doing those things, um, they get more help after disasters from state funds. Um, and so that helps to make sure towns are in better shape that way. Um, it's not actually required, um, but it, it, a lot of work trying to get towns to do that. And sadly enough, a lot of the documents are fairly pro forma, you know, just kind of simple lists. And as I said, not much ever changes. And uh, but it, it's a place where we're supposed to come together as a community and say, this is really what's on our mind. And this is really what we're going to chase money for. I think, you know, New Hampshire is kind of the same way. They don't, as far as I know, they're not required aside from the, the federal funding piece. You know, we do have to update them every five years. I, I really enjoy the process of doing it because I think it brings to the forefront a lot of things that as a fire chief, I see on a daily basis, but most people in town may not realize that this is an issue. So I, I think they're a very good planning tool. I mean, the big thing is the follow through, right? Because everything takes money. So trying to fix all these issues that are in the book, money and time just don't allow for it. But if you can pick away at what's in there, then at least you're moving in the right direction. Kelly, you're um, muted. Were you going to jump on that? Sorry, New York State doesn't require them either, but they do have to be updated, I believe, every five years. But in, in these rural communities where the supervisor might be paid and the clerk might be part-time, and that's the town's staff. And Essex County is the largest county, I believe, in the state of New York, geographically. So it I mean, they are just lists. And, you know, so we sit down in the last FEMA mapping plan, we sat down with all the towns in one room and tried to advise. But, you know, in some cases, that's not going to, because our expertise is so tiny and we're so, you know, we know what we want to see done. And it's sometimes hard to find a position. Um, so that's been very challenging. Um, um, the last you know, terrible flood we had, FEMA was still out there advoca advocating for in-kind replacement. So we're not seeing that kind of advancement across the board consistently up here in the Adirondacks with some of our agencies. So um, yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges we have is, um, is finding a way to identify the enormous variety of levels of tools that we need to A, have everything from planning to construction crews to, you know, geomorphic guys to people sitting in state offices and town offices that want to do the right thing and communities that will support it. All those layers and then sharing the same set of goals and knowledge, it's, it seems insurmountable at times. Um, and our success here in this section of this eastern part of the Adirondack Park is primarily just based on persistence. Um, you know, where we were, we had a ribbon cutting ceremony a couple of years ago for a project we finished and the governor's office and DC and all, you know, and I got up to speak and I said, oh my God, 10 years ago, you people were still laughing at us for doing this, you know, and they all laughed because it was right. It had been such a long slog to come to the same, I mean, and their pushback had made us rethink. It took a long time to do that. And I'm not sure there's a one-stop shop for one-stop model for how communities come together to ensure those resources, because there's so many other competing issues, you know, poverty, food access, health. So, you know, it's it's a real challenge, um, I think, to to get folks time and 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 focus on this. And we're very lucky here to have supervisors in towns and town boards and and a county planning office that really passionately cares about this piece of the puzzle too. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kelly. Um, I, I do want to ask each of you to speak a little bit more about funding sources. Uh, what you have found to be um, workable, um, and <clears throat> and then also, you know, Kelly, you brought up the capacity issue, which is certainly the case in all lots of communities in 
in all four of our states than in rural places. There's just, like you said, there, you know, there's a, a town, a couple of staff in the town, and that might be about it. Um, and so even just to have the capacity to put the plans together, never mind to find uh, the, to find funding and to pull all those pieces together. So, uh, but I'd like each of you to speak to that a little bit. Um, maybe we could start with you, Ned, just uh, from a, a statewide perspective, because you, I'm imagining you've seen a lot of different funding sources for different situations, um, but just share some of those resources and a couple of them that have been shared in the chat as well by the participants, but, you know, places to start, places to look. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I I, personally don't do a lot of direct funding work, to be honest, but I, I'm aware of it. The most accessible money is usually FEMA hazard mitigation assistance, which is money that's available after a disaster. A portion of that is set aside to make things a little bit safer before the next disaster. So that's the most accessible information or, or money by state. Um, and then beyond that in Vermont, we've had uh, the recent creation of the Flood Resilient Communities Fund, which is a state fund. And that has been very, very helpful because um, that, that's money that can help deal with situations that the FEMA money balks at, you know, like here's a house on top of a steep eroding bank. You know, it's not in the river yet, but it's going to be soon. You know, FEMA would say, is it wet? No, we, we don't deal with that, you know. And so this would be a way of dealing with some of those more dicey situations and also helping sometimes to match the FEMA hazard mitigation assistance funds. And then sometimes there's other money, which again, through the FEMA program is now called BRIC. Um, which is uh, basically a larger block of money for more intense, expensive projects with uh, a, a larger uh, planning horizon, perhaps. Um, so that would be the sort of money that would be going to a floodplain restoration project more likely. And some of that is, is often competitive, uh, either by state or by, by nationally. So it's, it's a lot harder to come by. Um, those are all funds. In, in the past, after Irene, we were um, appreciative of uh, community development block grants that were made available through HUD uh, through disaster recovery funding. And that was kind of magic money that um, was provided by Congress that was provided through the state funding mechanisms was able to match FEMA money, which was kind of a magic step, step or step. Um, it also did a lot of more creative movement of buildings and elevation type stuff which the FEMA money is very hard to use in terms of hazard mitigation assistance money. So um, that, that was really helpful. Unfortunately, under the current situation in Congress in July and since, uh, Congress is not providing money. So um, it's just really uh, locked up and never showed up despite uh, damages that occur all around the country. So that, that, that's unfortunately not there. Um, there are other funds too, but I'll stop there. But that, those are the big ones. Thank you. Um, Phil, do you want to jump in from the uh, kind of the municipal level? Yeah, so I mean, all the things that uh, Ned talked about, you know, the brick and the hazard mitigation money, we are also working with currently with National Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, through the USDA. Um, you know, they're, they're helping us to look at the feasibility of some projects for structure protection on the river. You know, the big thing I think with funding is it always comes with a match. And sometimes that's not the easiest thing to come up with. You know, these NRCS stuff is 75-25, so they come up with 75%. Well, someone has to come up with the other 25%. Um, the other thing, you know, that we've we've looked at for that side of it is in-kind, right? So we have a public works department that can possibly do some of the work that can go towards the match, that type of thing. Um, I think the big thing, and, and Kelly touched on it, is there's a lot of funding opportunities out there, but it's a lot of time invested in working with these organizations to get to the point where you even know if you need to do more or if you're out of the running, you know. So it, it's great that all this stuff is out there, but, you know, there's only so much time in a day to make these projects happen. Kelly, is there anything you want to add to that? Otherwise, we have... Um... We have other questions in the Q&A that we're going to move to, but if you have more to say about funding sources, resources, capacity. Yeah, so the, you know, the federal grant system, especially with the, the bipartisan infrastructure law in place is probably, you know, uh, the great 
great pot of money right now. There's no doubt about, especially in the Lake Champlain Basin, um, that, that there's going to be an influx of funding. And there's been a lot of push to especially look at road stream crossing solutions. Um, but yeah, so we rely on EPA funds, Fish and Wildlife Service funds, NRCS funds um, at the state level. Um, there's DEC and, and Department of State funds, um, Resilient Homes and Communities funds. And you know, the challenge there, as they pointed out, is not only is there a match required, but oftentimes federal money, you can't match state money with federal money or federal money with federal money or state money with state money. And, you know, there's there's so many complex rules um, that that's um, incredible. Um, we also use private funds. Um, some of the work we've done has been entirely on private lands and we've gotten owners to pay for it, which of course doesn't happen that often, but can. Um, and the other thing that I'll just mention um, is that one of the things that we've done in the past is there's a um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service facility in West Virginia called the National Conservation Training Center. And we've sent a local um, a, a Department of Public Works folks to that so that they're trained in some of the basic concepts um, so that when we put an excavator in the water or if there's an emergency and we can't be there because we try to work closely with our towns, but they're the people, I'd be in the way. They're the people that need to be at the emergency. But when they go and they've got some basic principles in their mind so that it's not just Kelly's going to yell at me if I do it this way, but I learned that I could do it this way and it'll be easier for me and Kelly to undo and do it the right way when I have time. But right now I know I can do this. So those just those, some of those um there are some resources that I think can elevate that in kind support. And I think we should all be thinking a little bit more about that. Great. Thank you. So I want to get to some of the questions in the Q and a we've answered, or you have all answered some of them. Um, but this, this one is, is one that's a competing priorities. Um, uh, like you were talking about earlier, Kelly. Um, and, uh, so, scenario is posed here that you know property owner has plans to develop elderly housing or work workforce housing child care um but the land uh the land is on the river and would actually be an effective floodplain space so question is do we support the needed housing and the needed tax base and business development or do we limit private landowners use of their property well, I, I, you know, it's a tough question. We can't tell a landowner what to do and not do beyond the fact that there are standing rules and regulations. So in, in the Adirondack Park, you would need an APA permit as well as a DEC permit. That would take some time. Um, so you would not be building in proximity to the river. Um, Increasingly, towns in the park are creating floodplain regulations, and they're, I think the big block in people's heads is what's the floodplain? So, you know, it's a little easier. Sorry, I think it's a little easier in Vermont. There's just fewer of you, right? There's a tighter space, and it's it's really this sort of like incredible discussion in New York State or non-discussion. Um, but, you know, so are we going to use the 100-year flood mark? Are we going to use the 10-year flood mark? What are we going to call the river corridor? Can we include that meander? It, it, it It's not settled yet. But the more that we can get towns to designate their floodplains separately from the APA, so you can just sort of defer to APA, but you can create more expansive, and some of our local towns are doing that right now, the more that decision will be moot. So the landowner will say, Hey, I'm buying this town, this this land in the town, and and ideally, also our realtors are going. Just want you to know that floodplain regulations in the town of you know whatever are pretty restrictive. So you might want to think about you know where you can develop here. So and we've had realtors do that. We work closely with some of our local realtors. Um, so I think you know if you've got no basis to say no legally, you have no basis to say no legally. Would I talk to those landowners? Would a town supervisor say, Kelly, could you sit down with these folks and explain to them why we have these questions? I would do that. Um, and I would make as passionate an argument as I could. Ned or Phil, do you wanna um, expand on that at all? Well, I think that, that answered it, I think. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a conundrum for sure, and especially when there's conflicts like that. There are places um, 
many, many towns in Vermont have adopted regs that basically say, no, we're not going to put more structures in the floodplain. You know, we don't have the emergency personnel to get them out. We, we, don't, we don't have a way to make sure this is permitted and safe. Um, and so they simply don't do that. That makes a lot of sense. The state model right now basically says, yes, you could put a structure there, but it needs to be, again, elevated so it's safe from damage two feet above the flood level and no net fill. So you're not increasing the risk on neighbors. So what's the outcome of that? You could end up with a place where everybody is safe and happy and has electricity on and the toilets work, um, but the whole, you know, the, the cars and the lawnmowers and the uh, and the whole landscape is all covered in silt, you know, and you can't really get out of there for a week. Um, but we get anywhere to the grocery store or something, but you're safe, you know? So, I mean, that's kind of the trade-off on another level is just how those things play out. Um, but yeah, the river corridor is another element where, again, again, the idea is to leave room for the river. And so that's, that's looked at together with the floodplain aspect and the interest, again, in the river corridor is to leave room so that the meander can change over time. Um, but if there's already a whole bunch of buildings there or there's a, a state highway there and you're on the other side of that, um, that's not so much of a problem because we're never gonna let the river go there because we're gonna protect the existing buildings or the existing state highway or something like that. So we're trying to basically find a way to wherever there is reasonable room for the river to handle its energy and to adjust to its sediments and debris and water power we're trying to protect that. But uh, again, even in there, there's ways of accommodating some kinds of infill um, within the landscape. Great. Um, we have another question about um, historic buildings. And uh, I think, Ned, you brought this up earlier where there was an example of, of a project saying, uh, working on um, you know, acquiring it and moving it. So. Uh, the question is really, you know, can you just speak to how that how that works um, while you know balancing your your flood flood mitigation efforts because communities want to preserve their historic buildings and their um, historic yeah. areas. So yeah, no, it's a really important question and it's a real New Englandy thing for sure. You know, I, I I grew up in Connecticut, so I I love these old brick mill towns that are half collapsed and. Uh, very charming. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it is all the way through, you know, Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Maine and Vermont and, and parts of New York. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a deep important history to that. Most of which was chasing water power and, and putting people in, in development right at the focal point of disaster in many ways. So it's, it's a real problem to figure out where, how to move forward with that. One thing that can be done is that buildings can be made, at least those buildings in particular can be made safer, which is to say you can do flood proofing measures on the buildings. In, in downtown Montpelier, a lot of the old brick buildings along the North Branch, you know, were built way back in the day and they have basements, you know, and the, the business owners come in and they, uh, they set up shop at the street level and they put their inventory in the basement. But, you know, we're looking at a flood frequency of, you know, more than 10% every year. So, you know, they're going to be basically losing their inventory, you know, repeatedly um, trying to stay in business. And that's, it's not a very easy and successful strategy for a good business. So we've got to find ways of giving them space for inventory that is safe, as well as flood proofing the utilities, elevating the utilities, getting these things out of the basement. The, the National Flood Insurance Program which most communities participate in, creates a big loophole for historic structures. It basically says, you know, if you have a historic structure, you know, most structures, if they're getting substantially fixed up, substantially improved, or they're substantially damaged, they have to become flood safe. They have to become elevated above the flood water. But historic structures don't. They have a, they have a standard exemption that most communities choose to use that basically says you don't need to actually elevate the lowest floor above the flood level. But that creates an attractive nuisance and a trap for people using the building, living in it, living upstairs or, or using a business at the ground level. And that's, that's a real problem. So the towns don't need to adopt that standard, mind you. Um, they could basically say, you know, if you don't elevate, you know, if you can't you know, one, you need to elevate your utilities as they get destroyed. They need to be elevated and replaced. They have to be higher and safer. That can be done easily. And that is the, that is the case. 
Um, but also, you know, you, one of the elements in that regulation is, is that, you know, if it's getting substantially improved, then that basement level, the hole in the ground that always fills up with water and, and challenges the integrity of the foundation of the whole building could be required to be filled in and turned into basically a flood vented crawl space or some other space that's less likely to damage the building and more likely to last longer. Um, so that's that's all quite easy to do. As, and, the, and that requirement is, is a requirement as long as the building um, doesn't end up losing its historic status for the community. And uh, so that's something that has to be judged by the, uh, the, the state or the federal people that look at uh, historic resources to say whether this change is gonna make a difference. Losing the basement is usually not a, an issue at all. Elevating the, elevating the building on the streetscape so it's suddenly like a, you know, a building that's 20 feet in the air, let's say, or something silly. Um, that would be suddenly, it wouldn't look very historic. It would look like a curiosity. And so um, the, the, these things would not be required, um, but to the extent that the building can become flood safe, it, it is required to become flood safe. Anyone want to add to that? I mean, I think in the end, it's it. This is these are you know owner decisions, right? But uh, I do think that over time, it becomes so incredibly evident um, when a historic bridge is a pinch point and badly skewed and can at some point endanger lives. Um, that it it needs to be removed. How it is treated and handled and where it is placed afterwards can all be a discussion. Um, uh, you know, in, in the Adirondack Park, there's a, uh, our small towns, our small villages are known as hamlets. Um, and they are restricted by their ability to expand their APA park definition and that regulatory framework. And, you know, we've pushed for years for the APA to allow some of these smaller uh, hamlets to expand. Um, slightly and strategically so that people can move uphill so that they have the option of when a house turns over in a family, that family can choose. Because what we are seeing is in chronic flood areas in, in these underserved communities, people are choosing to move. They're beginning to understand what we can and can't do, um, what, we, what we can help the river manage and what we can't. And there's actually been some pretty notable decisions in the past few years to sell the family home, the town can blah, blah, blah. So, um, and having more um, infrastructure money and state money to, to be able to do this, to put that land into an easement is also a, a nice option. Um, so difficult issue. So we have one um, specific question and then I wanna close with a, a, a broader question. Um, so Kelly, I think this one is to you. Um, you had given that example of the farm field um, and the question was, you know, did the plan include removing soil to lower the land level? It is in process. So it's this summer we're doing a full topographic analysis and then a full analysis of the of the immediate river system, the adjoining uh, floodplains um, on either side of the channel and, and the road that's involved. Um, we'd like to not lose the topsoil investment of the farmer, um, but um, we're not sure at this point. We do have, it. if you imagine a river bend and you've got these floodplains with a road sort of nice, a nice oval of road, nice oval of land, river on the bend, right? The, the, the farmer's property is sort of the, the downstream two thirds. The top stream two thirds is out of production field. So we're pro we have the option of really using that field and manipulating that field to create the roll of water that would come in and go off more efficiently, leaving perhaps ice behind. So we're we're feeling positive about it, but yeah, we are aware of how you manage that, you know, how many inches. So that, that's an ongoing conversation. We anticipate construction next year. 
Um, so give us a call and come out and see what we decided to do. Great. Um, well, one of the one of the questions in the Q and A was broader about uh, what you know. Are there examples in other parts of the country or other parts of the world that you have seen uh, that are inspirational? You know, that are showing you know how you can effectively do this work. Um, any any good examples to share? Well, we're really excited that we have partners working in Vermont and, and other states here in the Northeast. I mean, there's a lot of cool work going on, I think, particularly in Vermont on farmland where, you know, streams have been challenged in very different ways than they are here in the steep Adirondacks. And it's really exciting to see different methodologies coming out. Um, I always say, because there's sometimes there's like our methods better, our methods better. I can say it's all context, right? It's really all where you are and what your goals are and what resources you're dealing with, especially in terms of biology, right? And ecosystems. Um, do you expect the land around it to work in the future or not? Um, are you building a, a, a wilder place, restoring an ecosystem? So um, I think I think that's, you know, one of the important keys. I was just going to say, you know, I think there's when I when I look at for guidance and this type of thing, I, I can't necessarily pick one thing. But what I do is I, I do things like this, right? I attend attend a lot of webinars, and this is the first one I've been fortunate enough to present at. But you know, if you take take in as much information as you can and use a little bit from everybody, then that's where you find the best the best answers. I think is you know everybody's experience. I know I've learned some things today that I didn't know about before, so. That's what's important. Attend as many of these things as you can and, and get out there and talk to people that have done it and are doing it. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's lots lots of creative work going on around the world, really, around these kinds of issues, people trying to figure it out. And uh, that's a great sign for our hopeful opportunities. Um, I guess, you know, in, in Vermont, there was... Uh, a, a rail line near the Missisquoi, which um, was one of those classic barriers to accessing meanders and floodplain. And as that was uh, deaccessioned and became a rail trail, it became possible to create um, interruptions in the in the line such that it came down the grade, and it allowed for the conveyance of flood water across what had been basically a levee, a barrier before that. So eliminating the the berm by having these periodic openings um, so that you know that's a that's a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of I think of that uh, in right here in Montpelier uh, along the dog River just up river of our uh, sewage treatment plant our water resource recovery facility which is like right at the edge of the floodway very vulnerable structure to to damage um, but if the the railroad that comes in on the other side of the Dog River um, could only be encouraged to put in a couple of culverts to let water through it. Um, it might be possible to access some of the floodplain on the far side of that rail line. And that would be a great benefit to a critical facility and the community and the watershed. Um, and so it's in part, again, it's just the really thinking audaciously on some level and then trying to get the railroads to work with us, which they don't, you know, so there's a huge, a huge process to all that. And I'll, I'll point to one resource that I put in the chat, um, Amy, the, um, the, the Netherlands government, um, along with the American Flood Coalition, created a book called Ad Adaptation for All. And the link is in the chat. Um, we were in that section with our climate ready culverts, but it really gives you a sense of the range of work, I mean, obviously the the Dutch government, the Netherlands, it's just they're just like way ahead of us um, for all kinds of obvious reasons. Um, and they were working for many years when I was working several years ago for another organization. They've been working many years in in New Orleans. Um, so there's a lot of coastal work that we can learn from, and a lot of work in other places. And and I also think we're all generating some really good models here, um, as well as out west and. Um, so there is. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. And good good to leave on a hopeful note. Uh, we are coming up on 1.30. Uh, I want to thank all of you, Ned and Kelly and Phil, for joining us today. Really appreciate your time and sharing your expertise and your experience. 
Um, so thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank everyone who joined us today. Uh, we had quite a few participants, so we uh, appreciate people joining. Um, there's going to be a, a link to an evaluation put in the chat. It will also be shared with all of you who joined today. So we are, we are always looking to improve these and always looking for further uh, topics. Please take a minute to, to fill out that survey. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, I mentioned before that there will be a follow-up that will include a, a lot of these, as many of these resources as we can capture, as well as contact information for the presenters so, and the recording, so people can take a look out for that. Um, and just lastly, uh, a plug for uh, the next webinar in the uh, Northern Forest Center's uh, forest program team is offering a webinar on April 17th. This will be a panel discussion of the new report called Beyond the Illusion of Preservation. And uh, three of the seven authors will be joining uh, for that uh, webinar. So please take a look out for that. Uh, I believe the registration will be um, linked in the chat so you can take a look. Um, so lots of good information to share through these webinars and just really appreciate everybody participating. So thank you very much and uh, good luck to all of our towns working on <laughs> working on these mitigation issues. Thank you.